Hey guys, here's a little extra for all of those of you nerds out there who want to see the rest of the proof. Um, let's get to it. So, step three, what we want to do here is to set this, show that the scores are actually equal to zero. So, the problem that we might encounter here is what if theta hat were on the boundary of, uh, of the set of thetas? In that case, the score at theta hat might not be zero. So for example, if we're constraining theta hat to say that it needs to be positive, then the scores might not equal zero. Fortunately, we've assumed, we, we know that theta hat converges in probability to theta naught, and we assume for this theorem that theta naught is in the interior. Then theta hat will also be in the interior with the probability approaching one. So we're kind of cheating here. We're assuming that the true parameter lies in the interior and is not on a boundary. And then the estimator will not be either as n grows to infinity. So therefore, the scores will equal zero with probability approaching one. Recall that what we're showing here is asymptotic normality. So what we're showing is what happens when n tends to infinity. So we're not thinking of small sample stuff here. All right. So we had this mean value expansion, and now let's insert this. And these guys are equal to zero. Good, all right? Let's try and isolate theta hat minus theta naught. So we start by moving this on the other side, and then multiplying by minus one. Now we have this thing here that we don't want here. We wanna move it on the other side. To do that, we need this sum of matrices to be invertible. And we're going to show that on the next slide, that, they, uh, that that's in, in fact the case. And then we multiply by square root n on both sides, and then we divide by n here and divide by 1 divided by n in here, so that we have 1 over n and 1 over n, so that these are actually averages, and we have the square root n. So you can see that this is starting to look like what we're gunning for in the proof. Okay, so... We needed that invertibility of this sum of matrices. Turns out there's a useful lemma in Woolrich. If we assume that R, this function R, follows all the same conditions as our Q function does, then lemma 12.1 from Woolrich tells us that the average of these functions converges to the expectation. But note that it says theta hat here and theta naught here. So the law of large numbers tells us that if we we've, were to evaluate uh, by theta naught on both sides, then these things did in fact converge. So this theorem, this lemma here is telling us that even if we're evaluating it at something that's not theta naught, if this thing converges in probability to that thing, then we haven't broken this convergence. Okay, why does this give us invertibility? Well, because the operation of inverting a matrix that's a continuous operation. So if the limit of the matrix that we care about, this thing here, if that limit is invertible, then with probability approaching one, e this sequence here at each step will be invertible uh, with probability approaching one. And we, so one of the things that we're gonna assume in this theorem for things to work is that this limit is in fact invertible. In other words, that the expected Hessian is invertible, and when when the expected Hessian is invertible, then this average Hessian evaluated this theta plus that is wedged between theta naught and theta hat, this thing becomes invertible. All right, so let's shorten up the notation a little bit and call the average Hessian a n and the probability limit expected Hessian a naught. Okay, so. What we had before was this. Let me go back and show you. We call this guy here a n. So a n to the minus one. Here we go. So that's the same. All right, next step. We add and subtract a naught. What we're gonna try and do here is to show that we can swap this theta plus by theta naught if we add an OP1 term. That's what we're going to show. Okay, so the first step is to add and subtract a naught. Okay, we can do that. That's just a fancy zero. All right, and then we split these things out. 
So in the first term, we're going to have a naught times something. In the second term, we're going to have a n minus a naught. It's this term here. Okay, then on the next slide, we will show that this thing here is OP1. This is big OP1, and this converges to normal. What does this mean? Little OP1 means it dies out. Big OP1 means it stabilizes. And actually, a clever student will note that this term here is the same as this term here. So, because this converges to a normal, which we're going to show in three slides, it in particular stabilizes. But the neat thing is going to be that because this thing dies out, it's going to kill off this entire term here. So we don't have to worry about it. All right. So again, there's this term. It's the same as this one, we call them one, and then there's term two here. Okay, so why does term two die out? Well, a n converges to a naught by the law of large numbers. So since inverting a matrix is a continuous operation, then the inverse converges to the inverse of the limit. It's called the Slutsky theorem. All right, so that means that the difference between the two dies out, and the way we write it is we, we call it OP1, little OP1. It means that it dies out in probability as n tends to infinity. But that's a long thing to write every time, so we just say OP1, little OP1. All right, this other guy here, by the central limit theorem, which we're going to show in the next slide, this thing stabilizes, in particular, converges to a no normal. And we write that as big OP1. Okay, so because the product of little op1 and big op1 is little op1, and this whole thing is little op1. In other words, this thing dies out, this thing stabilizes, so this one drags the last thing into the abyss. And then this thing stabilizes, and that's what's going to give us our limiting distribution. Okay, so summing up, we now have square root n theta hat minus theta naught, which is what we have in the, uh, in the theorem, what we want to get to. And on the other hand, we have other side we have something here plus little op1. Okay. Good. Now we want to invoke the central limit theorem. You may remember this mythical theorem from the first statistics course you took. What it says is that if x i is a sequence of iid stochastic variables that has some mean mu and variance sigma, then the average of x minus the expectation. If we blow that up by square root n, it stabilizes to become uh, normally distributed asymptotically. So, first off, note we have, we're not saying anything about xi. We're not saying in particular that xi should be normally distributed. Just saying that xi is iid. So it comes from the same distribution. And the core of this result is really it's a fundamental property of the sample average this thing here, that it becomes normally distributed. Why does it work in our case? Why can we apply the central limit theorem? Well, we are going to assume iid sampling over i in the scores, so the data that gives rise to this i, and we keep theta naught fixed. So then all that's changing in that sample average is really just the data, which is iid. So a function of a stochastic variable is itself a stochastic variable, and if the thing that is uh, at the core stochastic is iid, then the function becomes iid. So the scores are mean zero by definition of theta naught. That's the second part, because we need to subtract the expectation in here, and here the expectation is zero, but we need to be subtracting the correct thing for the distribution to become normal and the scores have mean zero. Perfect. And this is by definition of theta naught, that theta naught minimizes the expected criterion function. So it solves the expected first order conditions. Great. So now we invoke the central limit theorem. Here we have it. It's an average of something, technically minus its expectation, which is zero. It's blown up by square root n, so this becomes asymptotically normal. 
and then we're multiplying by, by some matrix in front of it. And then in the end, we have this OP1 term, which dies out. So in other words, asymptotically, asymptotically we don't have to worry about it. Okay? Important thing to notice here. The limiting distribution, therefore, comes from the scores. These are the ones that are asymptotically normal. The average score vector. Good. So we invoke the central limit theorem on this a0 times uh, uh, s, or the sum of s, and then we see that it, it becomes asymptotically normal. So if we say that b is the variance of s, then we have an, something in front of it. Recall from your basic stats course that if x is asymptotically normal with variance sigma squared, then ax is asymptotically normal with variance a squared sigma squared. Except that when you're doing this in matrix form, it would be a sigma squared a. So that's why here we have this number here and here on both sides, giving rise to this sandwich formula. It's just the matrix equivalent of taking the square. Good. And b naught is the variance of the scores, which is just this thing, because they have mean zero. You may recall that the variance which should be uppercase x here, the variance of x is e of x prime x minus e of x prime times e of x. And so when these, uh, the expectation of the scores is zero, this last term dies out. So that's why you get this outer product of the scores, which is important. And this a naught thing is, as we defined earlier, the expected Hessian. So we have that the variance comes from the expected Hessian and the expected outer product of the scores. That's super important. So here's the theorem in all its glory. We assume compactness of the parameter space. We have some technical conditions on Q. We assume that the true parameter lies in the interior so that the first order conditions will work. We assume that Q is twice continuously differentiable in, in theta so that we can actually have the Hessian and the, uh, and the scores. And then there are some additional technical conditions. We assume that the Hessian's elements are bounded. So, yeah, technical condition. We assume that A0 is positive definite. That means that we can invert it. So recall that I said that we assumed that this limit was invertible. And then we showed that the uh, corresponding sample average version uh, would also be invertible. And then we assume that... Uh, scores a mean zero with finite variance. In other words, B naught here must be finite. If these conditions are met, then our estimator is asymptotically normally distributed. And this is how we estimate the asymptotic variance. So let me give you the sloppy version of the proof again, and maybe it'll make even more sense this time. So we have the scores here, the derivatives, and then we started from this mean value expansion. Recall that the mean value expansion is basically saying that if you drive from A to B, then at some point you must have been driving at the average speed. So at some point, theta plus in between theta naught and theta hat, the derivative is equal to the average change. That's the mean value expansion intuition. Then we showed that the scores were uh, equal to zero with probability approaching one because theta hat would not be on the boundary when theta naught was in the interior. Then we isolated theta hat minus theta naught. And to do that, we had to uh, take the inverse of this matrix, and we showed that that makes, made sense. That matrix would be invertible. Then we showed that we could swap theta plus by theta naught if we added this OP1 term that we didn't have to uh, worry about. And finally, we uh, multiplied by square root n on both sides and showed that this thing here was a sample average of something IID, so it converges in, pro in distribution to a normal. And there we go. We're done. That's all. Thank you for your attention.